So if you're a DevOps a guy or a girl who needs to manage a lot of servers, uh, you're gonna wanna check out this uh, next video. It's called, it's from Ansible Works and they help you manage your cloud servers and we're gonna find out how right now. And who are you? My name is Tim Gurla. I'm the co-founder and VP of Support and Services at Ansible Works. Uh, I've been in infrastructure software a long time. I joined Ansible Works about six months ago, uh, earlier this year. And um, I've gone through a, a couple of uh, IT automation companies and a, a cloud company. Uh, Ansible really appealed to me for a couple of reasons, which hopefully we'll be able to talk about today. Yeah. So what, what is, well, first of all, Ansible is in a pretty crowded space with Puppet and Chef and SaltStack, mm -hmm. right? Yes, absolutely. And, and so uh, let's just take it from there. What does Ansible do that the other guys don't? Sure. Ansible has a couple of unique attributes compared to the other tools out there. Uh, our, our, main, uh, our main style, our main approach to marketing has been about, around our simplicity. Uh, so there are some... There are some specific features of Ansible that make it really easy to get up and running. It takes, uh, for, for most people who, you know, an intermediate Linux sysadmin, you can actually be, you can actually do useful things within about 20 minutes of starting with the, with the tool, which is a lot different from the other, uh, the other applications out there. Uh, number one, our, our syntax for describing uh, the, the steps of automation that Ansible does is very simple. Um, it's easy to read. It's intended for even a non-technical person to be able to take a look at one of these playbooks, which is what we call them, uh, and see what's going on and, and understand and, and be able to uh, maybe even contribute to the, to the, uh, to the list of steps. Um, we also have a, a unique agentless approach. So the machines that are under management don't have to have any software installed on them except for Python and SSH. So it makes bootstrapping, especially in a, in a cloud environment uh, like, like Rackspace uh, or OpenStack, really uh, easy to do, easier than the other tools. And you, you don't spend time managing the management like it you do. It sounds more other. secure, too. At yes. Microsoft, we talked a lot about attack surfaces. And mm -hmm. anytime you put code inside the firewalls, you're opening up a potential uh, attack surface. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. Ansible does all of its communication over SSH. Uh, we think that SSH is one of the most widely used and, and most uh, heavily security tested tools out there. So instead of you know, rolling our own crypto or acquiring our own PKI, uh, we simply use your existing SSH policies. We can use SSH passwords or, or keys if you have keys in place. Um, and, and that really does lower the attack surface and it, it, it uh, keeps us out of having to, to, to build our own uh, security protocols and so forth. So you guys have, uh, you started as an open, open source uh, uh, foundation, right? And then uh, uh, now, now you're released as a company. That's right. Um, what pieces are going to be um, monetized, I guess, and mm -hmm. what pieces are going to remain open source? Sure, good question. So Ansible itself is about almost two years old, uh, created by Michael DeHaan, our CTO and co-founder. Uh, we, we are continu continuing, of course, development of Ansible itself. Uh, it's on, I think we're, we're up to 13 or 14 releases of the tool uh, with about 250 different uh, contributors in, in the entire system. So Ansible is and will remain open source, of course, and it's a, it's a fully featured tool. It's on the command line. Uh, it's got lots of, uh, lots of modules built in to manage lots of different devices and, and applications. What we're building on top of Ansible uh, for commercial use is a tool called AWX, which uh, is kind of an abbreviation for Ansible Works. Um, what it is is a it's a web UI. Uh, it's a it provides a REST API to the to the system, um, and and the it, it adds additional layers of management on top of Ansible. So you have things like role-based access control, so you can delegate authority and operations to to people on your team. Uh, you can manage your inventories of, of hosts under management. You can manage saved job templates, which I'll show you in a couple of minutes, that let you just uh, trigger a certain operation with a single click. And we're going to continue to add features and, and functionality to the system, things like uh, auditing and logging analysis, uh, reporting and charting of, of interesting DevOps metrics. You, before the cameras turned on, you told me, uh, talked to, to me about orchestration. Can you cover what you meant by that and why that, why Ansible lets you do orchestration where the other tools don't let you do it so so cleanly? Sure, sure. So, uh, 
Ansible does both configuration management, which is kind of the initial um, the initial provisioning of systems, you know, making sure that certain packages are installed, making sure that files are in certain places, making sure various configuration things are, are done. Uh, we can also do ongoing um, application deployment as, a, as just a set of tasks that might have to be run. Um, and we can also orchestrate across multiple hosts. So what we mean by orchestration is sort of coordinated sequences of events across uh, multiple servers in your environment. Um, these days, you're not going to find a, a single application out there that runs on a single server in, in a lot of cases. You're going to have load balancers, you're going to have monitoring systems, you're going to have uh, multiple web servers. And what Ansible is really good at is, is orchestrating or coordinating the, the operations across those multiple tiers of your infrastructure. So what I'll be able to show you is actually a, a rolling upgrade, a zero downtime rolling upgrade of a, of a small, simple web application uh, coordinated by Ansible. Um, and our language ma uh, playbooks makes it really easy to describe those, those uh, orchestration events. Can we see it? Sure, definitely. Yeah. Then that would give us more context for the rest of the conversation. Yeah, so what I have here, I have a handful of, of, uh, of cloud servers um, running in Rackspace, of course. Uh, these are just empty CentOS 6.4 uh, systems. Um, we should cover that. You work on Rackspace and Amazon and other players? Or Absolutely. Tell me about the platforms you support. Sure, sure. So we like to call Ansible batteries included. So it comes with a bunch of modules um, responsible for things as simple as file manipulation, make sure this file exists here, all the way to more complicated things like calling APIs, like calling the Rackspace API, for instance. There's a module in the system called Racks that's let, that lets you launch uh, uh, cloud servers right in your orchestration scripts. Um, so we have support for, for Rackspace, uh, OpenStack private clouds, uh, Eucalyptus private clouds, uh, Amazon, um, I think there's a couple more. We, we're getting, a lot of our modules come from the community um, and we add probably uh, one or two a week at the, at the rate that we're going. Cool. All right, so I have a handful of VMs in, uh, in Rackspace and I have, um, I have some playbooks here. The, I'm not gonna go into detail uh, about the playbook language, but it's fairly simple and what you do is you describe um, the, the task that you're doing and then the module that you're calling. So there's a, for, for Red Hat slash CentOS style systems, there's a module called yum, which is responsible for installing packages or, or removing packages on the system. Um, and, and this is kind of a, an example of a declarative uh, uh, task where we say on the systems under management, these are the packages that must be installed on the system. And Ansible takes this task and it, it makes it so across the, the, uh, the system. Um, we have two tasks here. The, the first one installs some packages, and the second one makes sure that a service is started. So we've got a, an example out there. Um, it's a, a simple LAMP stack with a, an HA proxy load balancer in front. And it's, it's constructed of a series of playbooks, and then there's a, a rolling upgrade script, which I'm going to show you. So I'm going to switch over to, uh, to AWX, which is our, our web interface to, to manage Ansible. You can do all this stuff on the command line, but there's some additional capabilities. Uh, exposed by the, the web interface. And I'll just give you a quick tour of this. Yeah, so organizations. So AWX has some multi-tenant capabilities if, if you're a contractor managing multiple, uh, uh, multiple uh, customers, perhaps you might use this functionality. I've got a couple of organizations here. Mostly I work in the Ansible Works organization. Um, we've got uh, the ability for multiple users to be created in the system and role-based access control can be applied to these users. Uh, I'm logged in as admin, of course, so I see all the functionality here. Uh, we can further break those users down into teams and projects. Uh, an important concept in Ansible is the idea of an inventory, and an inventory is really a, a, list, of your, um, a list of your hosts under management, and then uh, they can be categorized into groups. So you can have your web servers in a group, uh, you can further subdivide, and you can have uh, more complex groups like your, your East Coast web servers or your West Coast web servers or your West Coast web servers running CentOS 6.4. Yeah. So you can target these systems pretty, uh, pretty finely. Uh, inventory can be as simple as just a list of machines like I have here, or we can actually source inventory from the different cloud platforms. So once you've got your project and your inventory set up, uh, you need some credentials to talk to your systems. 
as I mentioned earlier, Ansible uses SSH to communicate with the, the target systems. So um, in most cases, you're going to have uh, a, a private key that, an that AWX stores, and you can have this backed by a password. Um, you can have the system prompt for the password when, it come, when, it, when it's required, and so on and so forth. Our goal really is to fit into any sort of key-based uh, authentication architecture that you have in place. Yep. OK, so once you've got your projects, your inventory, and your credentials set up, you can uh, create a job template. And a job template is just uh, something that you do periodically. So this might be uh, configuration remediation. It might be a new deployment. It might be uh, a set of tasks to provision new servers in your infrastructure. So I have uh, a, a, simple, um, a simple job template here to deploy this, this, uh, this LAMP stack with HAProxy in front. And I'm going to go ahead and launch this. It'll take about, uh, depending on the speed of your network and how many machines you're targeting um, and the speed of the, of the VMs that you're managing, it can take between 10 to 15 minutes to do a full deploy. And this is doing everything. This is starting from a, a fresh CentOS image, just running Python and SSH to something that, that runs a, a very simple web service. Yep. While this is going through, you've got a bunch of ways to access the information. Um, you can see we, we can drill down into some of the, uh, some of the playbook steps here. And um, we'll first, we'll start by gathering some facts from the servers, things like their host name, what version of the OS they're running, what packages are installed, and so on. And then we go through the tasks, and uh, we can refresh and, and see what's going on. Um, if you get failures in any, of the, in any of the steps, you'll see them called out, and you can drill down. If you're managing hundreds of hosts, yep. you can actually go back to the inventory screen here. If, if it finds the wrong OS, does it automatically upgrade it in that step? Or? If that's one of the steps in your playbook, it will. You can, you can, you can instruct Ansible to say, you know, make sure all the packages are up to the, the latest version. Um, it's not going to uh, it's not going to do anything like that automatically unless you explicitly ask for it in the as part of the playbook. Got it. What you know, uh, I assume that people who try Ansible Works are either coming from a puppet or a chef, or they're coming from nothing, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And they're this is their first time into a DevOps world, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, for both of those use cases, what do they need to know up front? Uh, you know, if they're coming from Puppet and Chef, what, what do they need to shift about their mind or their architecture or what, how sure. they're doing things? Good question. Uh, the biggest shift in thinking from Puppet and Chef is to, to stop thinking of your infrastructure as, as code and think of it as data. So Ansible, uh, instead of writing code to describe your infrastructure, we're, we're trying to convey the idea that, you're, that, that, that the, the steps that uh, turn your servers into your infrastructure is, is simply data. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to learn a programming language, you don't have to you know, know Ruby to, to, to write your descriptions, you have uh, a text-based format, but it's not code, it's data. So, uh, and this goes back to some of our, our ideas of, of pragmatism and simplicity where you know, there's no reason necessarily to over-abstract ideas away in, into, uh, into you know, programming language and, and, and object-oriented ideas when really what most uh, what most DevOps and, and sysadmins want is just a simple way to express the things they have to do every day and make it automated and remove that element of human error when they're doing things like a, an upgrade of the application. And if they're coming, you know, the, the not using anything approach probably means that they started with a, a couple servers and now it's going to 50 and mm -hmm. they're things are breaking and they're losing control and yep. they need a system like this to help them. Exactly. What does that person need to know about, about putting something like this in place? Sure, the great thing about Ansible is that it doesn't take a huge, uh, it doesn't take a lot of training or, or a big shift in thinking to, to, to take your, you know, perhaps manual run book, maybe you have it written in a notebook somewhere. Uh, the, the most straightforward path is to take those, those steps uh, that you previously did by hand and translate them into Ansible playbooks. Um, that's, what, that's kind of how we designed the, the playbook language, to, to really model that, that notebook style where, OK, we're going to shut down the load balancer. We're going to pull this server out of the load balancer. We're going to shut down monitoring. We're going to apply this upgrade. All of that should translate pretty much one to one to your system. Um, I would say that moving from uh, no automation or maybe, maybe some handcrafted scripts to Ansible is probably the easiest path. Yeah. 
when somebody gets more advanced with Ansible, what's some of the tips and tricks that you tell the, the more advanced developer? Sure, there's quite a bit of, of depth in the, in the language in terms of the ability to, to store results of a previous command for, for, for future use. So for instance, if, you are, if you're launching a server in, in Rackspace and then need to do something to that server afterwards, you can, you can call the module that launches the server and then register the result which contains things like the IP address of the server. Um, you can then use that in subsequent uh, plays within the playbook. Um, there are some, some great ways to build reusable content, and we call them roles. So if we had time to dig into some of the more, uh, some of the, the playbooks that make up the LAMP HA proxy example, you see that we have, um, we have a, a role for Apache, we have a role for Nagios, we have a role for the database. And, and if you are careful about the way you, you develop these roles, you can share them with other projects and with other teams um, and, uh, and hopefully share them publicly on GitHub or, or someplace else. Very cool. How do I pay you guys? I, you know, if, if I'm a smaller company with 50 servers, how do, how do you charge me? Sure. We, uh, today we have a model that's based on the number of servers under management. Um, so if you have 50 servers, uh, the, the base price, I it's published on our website, it's, it's $100 per server per year. It's a subscription purchase. Um, and that gives you access to, uh, to of course, technical support for AWX, uh, support for Ansible itself, um, access to, the, to each, uh, each AWX release, and so on. Um, AWX itself is, is free for up to 10 servers, so you can download it and use it forever. And of course, Ansible is, is open source and, uh, and will remain so. Yeah. Does this help uh, in d disaster recovery plans? You know, it, it, because if a, if a data center goes down for some weird reason, there's a huge earthquake or something, mm -hmm. um, does it help me uh, get my other systems back up and running and, and more robust? Or? It, it certainly could. If you have your infrastructure described in playbooks uh, and you've, you've been careful about about not doing too many manual operations to your servers, you could definitely use that those playbooks to rebuild your infrastructure. Uh, one of the things that we think will be really powerful in the in the future, maybe even now, some people are probably doing it, is the ability to to stage uh, a disaster recovery site on a public cloud like Rackspace. Uh, if you've got internal infrastructure, you know if you have it modeled properly in, in with Ansible, you can deploy it here, you can deploy it there. It doesn't really matter as long as you you have the servers and the in the access. Very cool. Um, how are you guys funded? Tell me a little bit about your company and how many sure. people work there. Yeah, we are uh, about 15 people right now. We're going to be about 25 by the end of the year. We're hiring. We just raised uh, an A round of, of funding from, uh, from Menlo Ventures, about $6 million. Yeah, very good people there. Um, very cool. Is there anything else that uh, somebody like my brother who runs infrastructure for the government up in uh, Oregon, does he need to know to help evaluate? Because People who are watching this are probably trying to evaluate you between Puppet and Chef and sure. the other approaches. Sure, definitely. Uh, Ansible is, is super easy to get started with. It can, it can be you know, a, a 15, 20 minute process to get Ansible installed and, and, and run your first commands and write your first playbook. So there's really not a huge investment of time. There, there are not a lot of new concepts to learn. Once you get in, in depth, you know, you'll want to spend some time in our documentation. We've recorded a, a 20 minute video. Uh, we call it the quick start. Uh, it's not really training, but it gives you probably 80% of what you need to know to, to begin to be successful with Ansible. So it's a small investment in time. Uh, I recommend you make it. Very cool. Well, thank you so much what, for what you do for Rackspace because we use you guys uh, in our data centers and uh, thanks for what you do for our customers. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you.